I, I wasn't sure what to, to title this talk, but uh, I think it'll fit in well with what we've, what we've seen so far. Um, it's business time. Uh, <clears throat> and it, it, this isn't going to be as fun as that song by Flight of the Concords. Uh, it'll be a little bit uh, more like this. Um, I'm Jim Gay. Um, I'm writing a book about uh, DCI and just in general Clean Ruby at cleanruby.com. I'm on Twitter at Saturn Flyer. Um, this is me. Come up and say hello. There are a lot of people that I sort of know via Twitter that uh, have avatars that I'm sure look nothing like you. Um, the f doesn't like well. <laughs> that doesn't look like me. Uh, funny thing about this, I was actually speaking French when the picture was taken, so I don't know how it came out that way. But um, I'm one of the organizers of Arlington Ruby, and I have some shirts to give away. Uh, same one I have. We ran a conference uh, about a month and a half ago. Um, what's important to me when I write my Ruby and when I work on my applications is that I build user interfaces. Um, these are the things that I care about when I'm working with a, with a project. Uh, these are principles of user interface design. Um, <clears throat> but we also care about these things when we're building our applications, when we're putting together code. We care about these exact same issues uh, with the Ruby that we write. So while I build user interfaces that are used in a browser, I also do it in my code, and you do too. And I think it's really important to look at what you write as a user interface. Uh, who can tell me what the primary goal for software is? No takers. What is that? Support a business process. It's pretty good. Make the customer happy. <laughs> so, so what's what's the goal? It should work. Uh, that's that's the goal that we talk about with with agile approaches. We want working software. That's that's the end goal. And the way that we need to, uh, the, or the thing that we need to focus on in order to get there, is communication. And that's what a user interface is all about. Uh, this is a fantastic book by Uncle Bob Martin. Has anyone here not read this book? I think I, I never read it, actually. Uh, get it. It's, it's great. Uh, it has lots of uh, just nuggets of information on how to write good code. And a lot of it, even though it doesn't say it in the book, is about writing a good user interface in your code. Uh, <clears throat> The things that stood out to me in particular when I was looking at my own applications and studying DCI is that you should take naming seriously. I probably spend more time worried about names in my projects than any, any of the other developers. Uh, I, I worry about what the method that you write, what the name of that method implies about its use and about its result. Um, you should keep logic organized. You keep things that are dissimilar apart from each other and things that are similar, you keep them together. Uh, and we in the Rails community have sort of adopted this notion, uh, fat model skinning controllers. <clears throat> and a lot of what uh, people are doing today uh, sort of stems from this idea where we were building apps that were too big. Um, but we would uh, have our logic often in our controller, and we would decide uh, we need to move it to the model. And as a result, the models get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and that's not really what we want. We don't have fat models. We have obese models. Uh, and maybe this is how you get to the monolith that you talk about, where <laughs> you want to do service-oriented architectures. Uh, but maybe it's just that your models are too fat. Um, and I think it's important to realize that your, your data model is not the same as your domain model. Um, can anyone complete this for me? I think this comes from pragmatic, the pragmatic programmer. I wrote down the quote, and then I couldn't find... Uh, 
couldn't find the reference before the talk, but uh, Pragmatic Programmer is also an excellent book. The key long-standing hallmark of good software, uh, of good program is what? Does anyone have their own opinion? Maintainability. It's ability to withstand change over time. Ability to withstand change over time is pretty close. Beauty. Oh, that's, that's a new one. I have, but that's good. That we separate what's stable from what changes. Um, I can't remember whose talk it was that was quoting Avdi where he talked about how, how difficult it is to determine what, what it is that changes. Um, for the most part, it's behavior. We, we care about behavior. Our, our persistence layer, uh, as we've heard many people talk about separating our, our, our persistence out, is a great idea, and I'd much rather have someone else argue what you ought to do. Uh, I don't really care about where the persistence is. It's not really important when it's, it's business time. You, you need to worry about your business logic. The persistence layer can come later. You need to figure out how to solve problems uh, for making working software. Not to say that it's not important. Um, but I think I went dead on, on one of these. Okay. For the other one, I'll just shout. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so we need to separate responsibilities, and it's the responsibilities of in, in our application that we really care about. The persistence layer is important, uh, but you could decide that starting with SQLite is fine, or just starting with in-memory objects is fine, as long as you can build working software. That's our goal. We want working software. Uh, so I'm less interested in the arguments about how is the best way to break them apart. I think it needs to be done because it gives you the flexibility to focus on just the behavior. But we have to bring them together. And I think the difficult question is, where do you bring them together in a way that makes sense? And how can you build a user interface where you bring a new developer onto your project and you can point to the place where these things come together and it makes sense across the, the application? Um, so I think you need to put that in context. There's a lot that goes on, and you need to have a place where you can focus on that. And that's where data, context, and interaction comes in. DCI is, was created by Trigva Rienskaug, who also created MVC. Uh, and DCI is, is a complement to MVC. It's, it's supposed to be a, a place where you can um, control the procedures for how your objects are interacting. When we think about object-oriented software uh, development or object-oriented programming, we imagine our running application looking sort of like this, objects sending messages to each other. But when we focus on our, uh, on our code, we write classes, and we look at our objects in terms of classes. So we're sort of inside a class, peering out at the world and thinking, well, this class can do all these different things. But we don't ever really see it like this. But your application architecture matters. Your application architecture is not necessarily your framework. Uh, this is a great book about DCI, Lean Architecture, written by uh, Jim Copeland, where he talks about <clears throat> uh, a lean approach to software development and how DCI can help you fit the mold, where you can consider what, uh, what the different actors in your business use cases are doing and in what order they do it, and what the scenarios are. The one big thing that I, uh, I think stands out to me is that you can postpone decisions with a lean approach. Like I said, you, you don't really care about persistence. You care more about the business logic. So the persistence question can be answered later. And you can actually write and test a working application by only focusing on behavior. Your data objects can be a simple Ruby object. And that you ought to consider roles. Uh, you can have a user uh, object or class defines some representation of a user. 
<clears throat> and that user may, in one case, be a person asking a question. And in another case, it might be an expert answering it. Uh, somewhere else, they could be in an entirely different role. Uh, but what you care about is the behavior of when they are in, when they are playing that role. And your code really ought to be organized by how you use it. Uh, you shouldn't be building massive classes where you take all the logic out of your controller and you put it into your model <clears throat> because that's what a user can do. You should do it in a way that makes sense for actually uh, describing the running program. Uh, so, for example, if we were build an expert social network where you could sign in and ask questions, someone could answer them, do other things like register, we might have different methods defined in the user class where you start building this application and you realize you have to register. <clears throat> uh, and then maybe because it's a social network and everybody wants to build a social network, you can request friends. Of course, you need to accept the friendship. So you define that in the class. And then we're, we're experts, so we need to be able to ask a question, and other users can answer the questions. Update your profile. So your class starts getting bigger and bigger. And I've seen, I've done this before. I've seen a lot of other developers do this as well. And this is when you get that monolith. This is when you get massive things. But this is what a user does. So you keep going down this road of adding this logic <coughs> into your application classes. Uh, but what we really want to do is organize them in a way that makes sense according to their use. And these are different uses. And these really ought to live elsewhere. We don't care exactly what a user is. We just care that these things can be done. Uh, so with a lean approach, with the DCI approach, you see the whole set of objects interacting with each other. You <clears throat> design that in your running code. And you get a lot closer to actually seeing how these objects interact, rather than just classes of things that can perform some, some action. <coughs> uh, DCI is a lot more than just extending objects when you need uh, behavior. That's certainly a a good part of it, and I've written about that. Andre has, has written about that. Um, others have. <clears throat> and it's a great way to just take an object and give it the behavior that you want. But what's important uh, is that you define a use case in code. Uh, in DCI, we have data, context, and interaction. And they define uh, taking a data object, which is essentially persistence, bringing it together in some place that defines how these different objects perform their interactions. And that's really, to me, <clears throat> the crux of what's great about it. So I'll talk briefly just about some code samples. Implementation isn't necessarily the most important bit. Um, up at the top here, I, I, I started this convention myself where I actually define a use case in my comments. And I say, what are the primary actors? What's the um, <clears throat> secondary conditions, the scope of it? Um, and we take, uh, we take a description of some business process, and we start defining the prerequisites for it. But it's runnable code that shows what that is. And it's in this context class that I, I'm either, uh, when I initialize, I'm given something. <clears throat> in this example, we're asking a question. Uh, so in initialize, we get some parameters. And we uh, have methods that define an expert who can answer it uh, and uh, uh, a method that initializes the question. So I've got those, those down here. Uh, really, the implementation of what's happening here doesn't necessarily matter. But I can test this in that once I have that question, I can perform the actions that I want on it. I'll scroll up just a bit. And the way I've approached this is call is an excellent method name in Ruby where if you don't know what 
what method name to use, just use call. <coughs> because you can use lots of other things in Ruby, anything that's callable to take place of it. You can use lambdas and procs or unbound methods and, and things like that, just call call. So it's a great convention to follow. But if you're actually explaining your business use case, it probably makes more sense to use some language from your domain. <clears throat> In this case, this is defining how we ask questions of experts. And so we might start and finish. You might disagree, but you would actually sort of determine this with uh, the rest of the people building your business, how you define what that is. Uh, and it's, it's in here that we give these uh, objects their roles. Here I don't care that it's, an, that it's a user. <clears throat> it could be a person. Um, it could be a dog. I don't care what it is. I just give it uh, the ability to uh, be a questioner, someone who can ask a question. And then the implementation of what that role does and how it interacts is, is down, uh, down here. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> what I tend to do is define these, these contexts, and all the roles are defined within them. I don't really move any of this stuff out into a separate directory where I have object roles, uh, context or anything like that. I put it all in app models because app models is for modeling your application, not for persistence. And I've yet to, yet to find the need to actually take any of these definitions for questioner or expert and move it elsewhere because really this is the place where I actually care about it. And if I'm bringing on a new developer and I want to explain to them how the system works, I can show them these files. I can show these are our business processes. They don't have to understand persistence. They don't have to understand what the controllers are doing. They just have to understand how we execute this, um, this use case. <clears throat> so what's happening in this one, we start asking a question, but because we're in uh, uh, a web application, uh, we have requests coming in, or actually not even, not even really because of that. We have requests coming in, and, and you might ask a question but not get an answer until someone's available to answer it 10 days later. So we sort of break that out. Maybe there's no expert available. Uh, but yet, the still, still the use case is that you ask a question. Maybe the expert is notified of, of it. And I've got some of that down here. Create the question, notify the expert. Then the expert eventually will come back in to finish this. And we have the finish method where we have our behaviors defined for uh, the expert. Now, whether or not this is the code that you would write or the code that would be the best thing, this is a great way to just sort of break up your understanding of an application. And I've started writing apps this way uh, like this. So I don't really start to try to understand the business process through writing documentation or through writing tests. <clears throat> Excuse me. I start by trying to actually describe the interacting objects. And this is a great point of discussion for, um, <clears throat> for me and other developers. And I can take this uh, code and I can show this procedure for what should happen to the business owner and say, well, this is my understanding of how this should work. And it's actually very easy for them to grasp it. You don't have to. Uh, you don't have to write a, do a lot of documentation describing this. You don't have to sit with them necessarily with your cucumber uh, features, whether or not you like that. Uh, <clears throat> you can actually take runnable code and refactor it and play around with it and spike on it, and have something that's uh, not necessarily going to be tossed away. But what I think is important about putting it all in one place is uh, that reading code takes time. And for yourself, if it, if it is a monolithic app, <clears throat> if you're lost in classes that define what a user can do in any given situation, then it's difficult to piece it together. Uh, 
So if you can save time, you save money. Um, understanding code saves time. Understanding code saves money. So if you put it all in one place, you describe your business processes in a class <coughs> or in an object, that essentially represents the system of interacting objects. Um, <clears throat> you save time and you save money, but you control your locus of attention. <clears throat> Human beings really only have one locus of, of attention. Um, what time did you get home from the party last night? Well, I ask you that question, but your, your locus of attention changes from what we're talking about here to that. And when we do that in our code, uh, it becomes confusing and it's harder to keep things in your head the more we have methods strewn about our application, either in service classes that do this thing or, or just our user class that has all kinds of references. Um, and this is uh, the magic, magic number to keep when you're writing your applications. There have been plenty of studies that show that you can keep five plus or minus two things in your head at any given time. So if you can control what you have to think about, you can better perform your job. Uh, and this is a quote from uh, Trigvo Rienskog that I thought was apropos. Um, the purpose of DCI is to write code where it makes it easy for you to reason about what's happening in your running application. And if your running application is crap, you're not going to test it into quality. Uh, so why not write code that's easy to read, easy to see these objects interacting, easy to see what it is that uh, they do, um, and easy to implement the requirements. You build user interfaces. Um, I think it's important to really think about your code in terms of a user interface. Think about how it affects, affects you every time you go to that class to add another method. Does it make sense that <clears throat> that method exists when you don't actually need it? Um, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm writing a book. Uh, it's not in beta yet, but uh, in process. FullOO.info is a place where there's uh, a lot of reference code for different languages, Ruby, uh, C++, Java, um, on how to understand um, DCI. That's it. Any more questions? We've got five more minutes left for questions. Uh, I have a question. How is it uh, performance wise? Why? Did you do some tests? Uh, how does it extend? <coughs> I, I know, I know, I know what, what, what you will say, uh, that you, you can't compare usability to performance, but uh, still, we, we probably have this issue at some point. So if you should do some tests, how, how is it when you do your, your way with each stance uh, in comparison to you know, the classic approach? Um, <clears throat> so the question is, how does it perform? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, back to you. <laughs> uh, Ruby has a problem with extend in that it blows away the method cache and has to recreate it. Um, 
JRuby actually uh, is a lot better about uh, handling that. I think they only do that for the individual object. Rubinius is also better, uh, not quite as good as, as JRuby. Um, I don't have numbers for you. Um, but uh, I have three applications in production that use this technique. It has not affected it in any way. And in, it's more likely that you'll get better performance by just doing what you can with HTTP caching. So it, it really depends. Uh, but you can also use, you can use <coughs> delegators. I didn't really get into uh, DCI tries to protect the concept of self inside these, these methods that in the roles that the objects are playing. Um, Ruby is very flexible with method missing and being able to forward, forward request to other objects. So you can, you can delegate to another object to, to take care of it. So rather than a module, you might be able to get away with doing a class, um, and, and that will be fine. So there's, you know, it's not really, uh, it, putting code in context is really the argument that I'm, that I'm saying here, is that you don't really necessarily want to have just separation of behavior. You don't want to have all these other objects and not know when they come together or jam it all back into your controller. But you should be able to uh, write code like the sample I gave and decide your back end later. <coughs> that wasn't Rails. Maybe it was Web Machine. Uh, maybe it was Padrino. So I could write tested working, uh, a tested working application without deciding how the controller structure and the persistence there. Uh, so it, it, it allows me to postpone those, those types of decisions. So there's a better benefit than that. Uh, the code you showed uh, has persistence. You have saves or something like this. So, it, so you use uh, active record. About it, it does, but uh, when you write your tests, you can mock that out. Uh, you can decide later. But you're only assuming that it's active record. I have a find defined on a class, it could be whatever. So you can write you can write runnable code and still <laughs> adhere to the API that you expect, but change your change your persistence level. Yeah. So what is the added value of extending the object as well instead of creating another another one? For example, you start with the user, then uh, like from data of the user you create another object of an expert. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it could be a long answer. There's a concept of object schizophrenia or self schizophrenia where uh, Ruby is pretty well protected uh, against it, but <coughs> essentially the problems arise when you have a composite object and you attempt to ask one object inside that composite for to, to answer some message, and it goes to the wrong one, or you call super in the wrong place and it goes up the wrong tree. It goes to instead of the user class, it goes uh, up here. It doesn't need to. Uh extend the, the base object, like it uh, doesn't necessarily inherit from the object. Like if you create another object, and you just build, build it from the data taken from the user, or just delegate it like, to the user. Right. Uh, <coughs> you, could, you could do that. Um, but the, and that's mm -hmm. where I mentioned where if you, wanna, if you do run into a performance issue, you could attempt to delegate it instead of using it instead. OK, but <coughs> isn't it more natural? Like it's, it's what people used to do with object oriented programming. And just this, uh, uh, well, I, I like the idea of having a role, but using extend seems uh, seems to me artificial. It's like, it's natural when you think about that user becomes someone, but it can be like, um, for me, the, the same thing is like creating another uh, person that this, this user becomes. Uh, I suppose that might make sense. Uh, really, though, that's a workaround in problems in Ruby. Ruby doesn't allow you to unextend, yeah. so it's it's not really the problem with the paradigm. It's a problem with the implementation in the language. So Ruby is sort of uh, hobbled a bit uh, in whether or not it can do that well. Uh, to add to, to Jim's point, uh, Jim's presentation was about just uh, modeling business process as opposed to uh, just uh, making a second uh, thought in, in an object, uh, in a, in a uh, persistable object. So uh, the focus was like, I want to make sure that the business process is OK. Uh, and that's what, uh, what clients care about. Mm -hmm. 
my point was that uh, usually when people hear about DCI, they think that like it's scary in that extending uh, extending some object to another object, and maybe like implementing DCI, you would be using those building other objects from <coughs> from uh, like basic objects would be uh, something that more people would uh, like agree on. I can see that, but, but why? Why? Uh, why is extending an object scary? Because it's new. Yeah. Well, it's always been there. Yeah. You, when you extend uh, classes in Ruby, are just instances of class, and you can extend a class with a module 